Well, one person who was arrested on Friday again for standing up and uh, demonstrating against corruption and other issues is Zimbabwe novelist and filmmaker Tsitsi Dangarembwa. She was released on bail at the weekend and she joins us now from Harare via Zoom. Uh, Tsitsi, always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Good evening, Peter. How are you? Great, thanks. But uh, it must have been a difficult time for you on Friday, you decided to go outside your house with a placard, and I suppose there's a part of you that knew that the authorities were likely going to do something. Well, um, I had demonstrated before without any negative outcomes, and so I was hoping that Friday would be the same. The difference was that my other demonstrations had been personal, spontaneous demonstrations. They were not part of an organized call for a nationwide demonstration. And I think it was that potential demonstration of the people's displeasure that made the government clamp down. An individual is one thing, but a whole nation expressing its displeasure is another. And that is what the government did not want people, whether in Zimbabwe or outside Zimbabwe, to see. Because uh, the notion of ruling for the people it is something that the ruling party, ZANU-PF, prides itself on. And so anything that is contrary to the notion that ZANU-PF is ruling with the full consent of the majority of the people is very damaging for them. And so they had to make sure that that protest would not happen and clamped down in a very strong and aggressive manner. What motivated you to go out and risk it all, literally? Because um, from during the week already, we could see uh, what was likely to happen, given that they were picking up people and uh, they, were, they closed off at the city centre. What forced you, compelled you to say, you know what, I've got to go out? Well, I am not a human and the clampdown had been on politicians and it had been on human rights defenders. I am an artist. I attempt to make my films and to write here in this environment. And so I really did not think that I would be somebody that they would um, want to detain in any way. And also, since Jacob and Gary Vume gave the call for the demonstration, uh, several weeks ago, I had been in touch with him and with other people who were discussing the demonstration on social media, and I engaged very heavily, um, really put my views across very strongly. And so it really did not seem appropriate for me to have very strong opinions on social media and yet do nothing mm. on the ground. And as I had demonstrated before, I hoped that it would be okay. The strategy was to be out for about an hour just to make sure that you are seen and then come back, not to be confrontational in any manner. Uh, the messages were to be positive about building Zimbabwe, how we can create a better country, how we can move forward rather than condemning what has happened. Um, even in terms of Hopewell and Jacob, who are in jail now, the message was about freeing them, moving to the positive. And uh, one of the things I had been talking about on social media was that we needed to observe the COVID regulations of staying within your areas, making sure you had your mask on and social distance. Um, also, that we didn't engage in toy toying, singing, dancing, that kind of uh, violent activity that makes people breathe heavily and thus also exacerbating the spread of COVID. So these were all of the discussions I had been having on social media. And I did not really think that the clampdown would be that brutal on ordinary citizens who were not engaged in any organized activity against the government, but simply wanted to express their opinions um, through their constitutional right to do so in a peaceful manner. Mm. 
I did, I, the risk was always there, but I thought it was minimal. So oh. for me, in fact, with that arrest, I realized that something has shifted in the way that uh, the Zimbabwean authorities are dealing with citizens. And if they have been heavy handed before, that, uh, occasionally that is now becoming the norm. And I really felt that we have entered into a new era of the way in which the Zimbabwean government engages with the population. All right, Sitsi, help explain to people here in South Africa and those watching across the continent, what do you think has gone terribly wrong in Zimbabwe? I think a lot of things have gone terribly wrong in Zimbabwe, but I do think that to point fingers entirely at the current authorities might be to miss uh, the origins of some of our problems. We, the history of this part of the world has been extremely problematic. And within that problematic history, uh, Zimbabwe perhaps has a peculiar history in terms of its colonization by the British, a particular kind of British person and a particular kind of settler regime that put the country on a, a very negative trajectory. Um, and it was one of those interesting interstitial kinds of situations where people would look to South Africa and say apartheid is in South Africa and would look to the north, to Zambia, and say that was not settler colonization in Zambia. So it was a different kind of colonization. So here was Zimbabwe with a very repressive regime but sandwiched between apartheid South Africa and the countries to the north. And I think this puts Zimbabwe in a very difficult situation in terms of actually positioning itself with respect to the oppressions that we were suffering, and also with respect to the way the rest of the world viewed Zimbabwe. And then again, uh, within that colonial context, there had been the federation of Rhodesia and Yasaland, and southern Rhodesia, which became Rhodesia and then Zimbabwe, had been the favoured uh, point where the development had happened. And so there was this idea that Zimbabweans were ahead of other African countries, more educated, etc. And I think that Zimbabweans took on this persona and therefore neglected perhaps to engage with other aspects of what had happened to us in that time. So I think there's a lot of reckoning with the past that needs to be done mm. with the colonial past, how that formed us, how liberation was achieved during the liberation struggle, how we have essentially a military state, uh, which in the beginning was more hidden than obvious and which is increasingly becoming more obvious rather than hidden, but whose origins are in the trajectory of the 1970s struggle uh, towards independence in 1980. I think these are all things that have to be interrogated and uh, we, we need more honesty about um, where we want to situate ourselves. Even up until now, the Zimbabwean authorities will not admit that this is a military state, but it is obvious because as you said, the soldiers are on the streets. They are preventing people from moving. They, they are restricting our freedom of movement. They are going door to door, checking for suspects. Um, they are pulling people out of their houses in the early hours of the morning. They are abducting them and taking them to faraway places and subjecting them to, to horrifying kinds of torture. So this is going on. And, uh, I think it's been difficult for Zimbabweans to admit that, uh, Zimbabweans from all walks of life, because we had prided ourselves on being this educated and cultured population. So I think we have a lot of reckoning mm -hmm. to do with ourselves and our various histories. All right, so if you were able to speak to the president and have a frank talk with him, what would you say to him? I would ask him if this is what he really wants. When he looks out at Zimbabwe, is this really what he envisaged? And that for me would be an interesting question because a positive answer would indicate the unfitness for being a president. 
a negative answer could then open up discussion about, OK, it's not working, what do we do now? But um, those kinds of dialogues are not happening in Zimbabwe. They're not happening between the citizens and the rulership. They're also not happening as much as we need them to happen between different sectors of the population. Zimbabweans tend to identify with their profession, again, uh, not so much identifying with the nation and with other Zimbabweans, but with the profession. And so you find that certain professions identify across borders with other people in the profession more than they would identify between professions in Zimbabwe. Our society is just not structured in such a way that uh, we, we have those occasions and spaces where we can develop a national identity. And th this is one of the issues. So national identity has generally been something that is imposed on us from above uh, by the authorities. We are told that this is being Zimbabwean. And increasingly, the narrative is that being Zimbabwean is being ZANU-PF. And if you are not ZANU-PF, you are very potentially an enemy of uh, Zimbabwe, which is now conflated with ZANU-PF. One of the things that struck me about Friday and the arrests that were made was that one of the questions that was asked, this question was asked to me, and it was asked to some of the other um, people who I met at the central police station. So the question was, who is paying you? Wow. The idea is that any Zimbabwean who stands up to say anything negative about the government is in the pay of a foreign power. And this is a very destructive and divisive narrative that is being pushed by the government. Um, it's been on social media where government trolls, I think they might be, have been propagating the story that every demonstrator gets 20, U 20 US dollars from the US embassy, which of course is not true. Um, I've had people on social media ask me and say, Sissy, so who's paying you to propagate these views that you have been um, propagating on social media? And they would say, I am paid by ZANU-PF. I, uh, I am not ashamed to tell you who my master is. Are you ashamed to tell me who your master is? So the assumption is that Zimbabweans do not act as individuals who have agency in themselves, who have lived experience, that they can engage with and decide on whether it is a positive lived experience or not. Um, but Zimbabweans always need to have someone who is not Zimbabwean telling them what to do. So this was on social media, but I also had a similar conversation when I was arrested, and that led to some interesting conversations some of the young men that I met at the police station had been taken out and severely tortured and beaten for about four hours. Uh, one of them so severely that he had a collapsed kidney and uh, that was a potentially lethal condition, uh, potentially fatal. And so the, one of the questions they had been asked as they were being beaten was, who is paying you? People could not believe that these two young men could simply decide for themselves that my lived experience in Zimbabwe is not acceptable to me as a human being. I need to do something about it. All right. So um, this is one of the things that, was, that really struck me, that there's this idea that Zimbabweans cannot act out of their own agency. And I find this really shocking because the whole liberation struggle was about liberating us to be ourselves. Yeah. And now we see that um, we are not allowed to be ourselves once we have been liberated. But just as we were forced to take on a colonial persona, now we are being forced to take on a particular party's persona. And anything out of that is, is suspect. Um, it also brings up the question of, if every Zimbabwean has to have a master, then who is the master of ZANU-PF? 
that is another question that that, that whole narrative brings up. And um, so, so these were some of the things okay. that I encountered uh, that I am reflecting on as a result of that experience. Tsitsi, I wish I could talk to you for much longer. We're probably going to need to have a few more conversations, but uh, we're going to have to leave it at there for tonight. Thanks so much indeed uh, for sharing your thoughts and reflections with us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that's uh, award-winning novelist, filmmaker and... Uh, activist Tsitsi Dangarembwa, who's actually a Booker Prize nominee as well.